If you like the Bourne trilogy and Tom Clancy novels, you are bound to like tonight's panel and the book which accompanies it. In many ways, uh, that's somewhat unfortunate because Worm, the first digital world war by Mark Bowden, is not fiction at all like those other uh, films and, and books and uh, publications. Rather, it's about one of the most mysterious, elusive, and infectious bits of malware ever unleashed on the world, the worm known as Conficker. Conficker burst upon the cyber scene in the fall of 2008, and as Mark described in his 2010 article for the Atlantic magazine, one of the many places it landed was in a defenseless computer just across the way uh, from here at SRI International. SRI maintains these defenseless computers, which you uh, may know are uh, also known in the business as honeypots for just such a purpose. They attract malware like Conficker. But when Conficker hit SRI, it quickly became clear this was no ordinary worm. Three people at the center of the ongoing drama surrounding the Conficker worm are here tonight, and they're going to pick the story up from there. Mark Bowden, of course, is one. TJ Campana of Microsoft, who led the effort to defend Windows against the worm, is also here. And John Markoff, who uh, was one of the very first journalists to write about this for the mainstream media in January 2009 in the New York Times, is here to moderate. John is very definitely one of the top uh, reporters and writers in science and technology in the country. He's a good friend of the museum. He's a frequent moderator here. And I'm pleased to welcome him along with all of our panelists. He will introduce them more properly to you once they're up here. Let me remind you that you have question cards in your seats. We'll be collecting those near the top of the hour, so please do write your questions. We'll be collecting those and handing those up to John. And now please join me in welcoming John, TJ, and Mark. Uh, we're going to do this in several parts. Uh, I'm going to do a very brief introduction. And then Mark is going to talk and do a brief reading. And then we're going to have a Q&A. And then I think cards are going to come up, and we'll try to make this as inclusive as possible. Um, for our discussion tonight, um, Mark Bowden is a journalist who, of course, you probably all know is the author also of Black Hack Down. And you all probably also know it was the basis for a 2001 movie directed by Ridley Scott. Um, Mark was a journalist uh, first from 1979 to 2003. He was at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And for three seasons, he covered football. Is that right? That's correct. Um, over the years, he's written for The New Yorker, for Men's Journal, Atlantic, The Atlantic, Sports Illustrated, Rolling Stone. And I have to uh, mention that uh, Wikipedia notes that he was inspired to embark on a journalistic career by reading Tom Wolfe's book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Um, <laughs> True. I was inspired by The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test as well, but not to become a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in addition to, to Mark, um, we have one of the characters from his new book, T.J. Campana, who, uh, to my mind, is as close as you can get to a digital Sherlock Holmes. Um, he is also the senior manager for investigations at Microsoft's Digital Crime Unit. And he just gave me this great little sticker. Maybe he has some extra ones. Um, and he has many tales to tell. Um, so I just, before Mark talks, I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, our subject. Um, so the history of the worm, uh, the term, probably most of you are familiar with, but just let me set it out. Uh, you know, it originally came from a really wonderful science fiction novel written by John Brunner in 1975, um, in which he uh, posited something called a tapeworm. And uh, uh, the wonderful thing about that book, um, in particular with respect to Conficker, um, is that he sketched out a authoritarian uh, regime that controlled their society through uh, basically an omnipresent network. And um, the rebels loosed a tapeworm. And the only way the, um, the, the regime could get rid of the worm was to take down the net, and, less, and thus they lost control. So that will bring up Conficker, I'm sure. Um, you also probably all know that um, the first real worm programs were experimented with at Xerox Park in 1981 by two researchers there, John Schock and John Hupp. Neither, are either of them here tonight? Is John Schock here? Ah, yes, good. <laughs> so I was looking at your paper um, in preparation for this, and I thought it was, you know, 
So what's the difference between a worm and a virus? We go back and forth on that all the time because these terms originally both, both came from science fiction novels, and so they're, they're terms of art. But um, in the original Shock and Hup paper, uh, a worm is designed as, a, uh, a worm is simply, uh, is defined as a worm is simply a computation that lives on one or more machines. So we can go, for, we can go from there, maybe get into distributed computing. But also, um, in addition to the sort of the roots of distributed computing being here, I wanted to talk about the roots of computer crime. And um, Don Parker's not here by any chance, is he? Of course. So if we really want to know about the roots of computer crime, I'm sure it's somewhere in the 1950s or 1960s. Um, I was thinking about the roots of um, network crime. And to the best of my knowledge, um, and I, I'm certainly willing to be contradicted or corrected, um, but someone who was at the Stanford AI lab who um, has a great deal of authority told me he believed that the first computer crime was a drug deal done on the ARPANET in the late 1960s between uh, MIT AI students and Stanford sales students. Um, I would love that to be true. Uh, so. Uh, that's as much as I have to lay out. Why don't you take over at this All point? All right, Mark. great. Thank you, John. Yeah. I'm particularly well, delighted to be on a stage with two guys who actually know what they're talking about. Uh, I, I am, um, I'm an old newspaper reporter, as John mentioned. And uh, about 30 years ago, a fellow named Jim Naughton, who was the uh, managing editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, overnight uh, named me the science writer. And this was a terrific thing for me because I was working in a suburban bureau and it meant I got to come down and work in the main office. And particularly during uh, the 1970s, the Inquirer was really one of the preeminent uh, newspapers in America. So overnight, I was uh, one of the perforce preeminent science writers in America, all of which was, of course, completely unmerited. Uh, it turned out that Jim, in looking for a new science writer for the newspaper, uh, was going through the resumes of everyone on the staff, and he noticed that I subscribed to the Scientific American. <laughs> and that's how I became a science writer. The tr and the truth of the matter is that I was an English major in college, and I had started subscribing to the Scientific American precisely because I knew nothing about science. And I thought, well, hell, uh, you know, so much of the modern world depends on science and technology. I ought to make an effort to understand these things. And I, don't, I think that magazine has gotten a lot better, but uh, 20, 30 years ago, I couldn't read any of those articles. They always had a little, like, italicized intro that I could understand, but as soon as the actual article started, I was lost. So they had been building up in my closet for about three or four years. And little did I know that they would launch me to uh, the heights of American journalism. But I discovered, though, that um, in covering science in the years that I did it for uh, the Inquirer, that my ignorance was actually very useful uh, because I was writing stories for non-experts. And I was ignorant enough to ask the truly ignorant questions uh, that needed to be asked. So if I was interviewing a physicist at the University of Pennsylvania, I would ask a question like, well, what is an electron exactly? Um, and, and it became, it, it was so effective for me that it became a kind of a philosophy of journalism. So whether I'm writing about um, pro football or uh, a battle in Somalia or the Iran hostage crisis or, uh, or in this case, a piece of malware, I begin really at, uh, at ground zero. And if you were to actually listen to some of the initial interviews uh, that I did in preparation for this book, you would laugh because I have to stop the people I'm talking to literally every sentence to ask what they're talking about. Uh, like questions like, what's a router? You know, what's a server? What, what's an ISP? I mean, it was all completely foreign to me. What gripped me about the story, though, was that over the uh, months that I record in Worm, there was this fascinating intellectual struggle going on uh, between very high-level uh, computer security experts and some extraordinarily sophisticated um, authors of malware. Uh, the Conficker, as John mentioned, popped up in November of 2008 and rapidly began assembling one of the largest botnets in the world. 
And what was especially fascinating about this is that the ad hoc group of volunteers who started working together to try to corral Conficker, as they made moves uh, to, to try, try and fence this thing in, uh, the creators of the worm would make counter moves. And this went on move, counter move over a period of, of four or five months. So I'm, I'm going to read you, at, at John's invitation, a little passage from Worm. And I'll set it up just by explaining that um, after several of these moves and counter moves, Rodney Jaffe, who's this wonderful, burly uh, uh, South African who emigrated uh, to the United States years ago uh, and who has uh, become the head of security for New Star, uh, which is uh, a big telecommunications and internet-based uh, company in Washington, he became uh, the, the sort of de facto head of the cabal, as they called themselves, the Conficker Working Group. And as the Conficker botnet continued to grow, and as those who were battling it realized uh, that it posed a unique threat to the internet itself, uh, Rodney went to Washington to try and enlist the support of the federal government in fighting the thing. And so Rodney uh, uh, got invited to uh, give a presentation at the Department of Commerce because Newstar manages the .us top level domain for the government. So he was a contractor and he, he was invited in and he gave them his PowerPoint presentation which he had put together in his hotel room the night before about uh, the Conficker worm. And this alarmed the folks in the room who, much to Rodney's shock, had, for the most part, not even heard of Conficker. And he started getting invited over the next couple days to give the same presentation to various other places. So this passage I'm going to read you is like two or three days after Rodney has made his initial presentation at the Department of Commerce. The following day, he was asked to brief the staff of the Senate <coughs> excuse me, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Because the committee's offices were off limits to, zo to those without a high security clearance, the staff arranged to meet with Rodney in the visitor's center of the Capitol building, in the cafeteria. About a dozen staffers met him there in the middle of the afternoon. The cafeteria was quiet and mostly empty. They cordoned off a portion of the big room with portable dividers and sat around a long table. Before Rodney got started, one of the staffers, a young woman, interrupted him. Just so you know, she said, we probably know a whole lot more about Conficker than you do. We received a classified briefing yesterday afternoon, the woman said. So there's probably not much more you can tell us about it. That's really good news, said Rodney, his voice heavy with sarcasm. By now he knew without a doubt how clueless the establishment was. The woman's arrogance annoyed him. <clears throat> he started collecting his notes. Since you have matters completely under control, he said, then there's no reason for me to be wasting any more of your time. As he stood, there was a chorus of no's. Stay, protested one of the staffers. No, we want to hear it, said another. So Rodney sat back down. He took out copies of his PowerPoint presentation, which had been printed up on New Star stationery. He handed them out around the table. The woman who had addressed him flipped through her copy and pronounced, yep, this is the same presentation we saw at the classified White House briefing yesterday. <laughs> the meeting dissolved into laughter when the staffers realized that U.S. CERT had simply taken Rodney's briefing and presented it at the White House as their own work and classified it to boot. <laughs> Rodney later confirmed it with his White House contact who had attended all three of the sessions. They just gave yours as their own, he said. So much for vaunted federal cyber defenses. <laughs> Thank you. That's actually a terrifying no note to start on now that I think about it. Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's certain analogies that appear in your book at various times. And, you know, early on, um, I, I think at a certain point you gave the sense of the internet as Wild West. There's some sense of that territory stretching out in cyberspace forever. And that, by an analogy to my mind, sort of brings up the possibility or the, the sort of definition of the cabal as vigilantes. And I w was wondering, one, if, if 
you know, the vigilante term works? Is it correct? This is a question I'm asking of both of you. And then the follow-on question is, you know, since the feds aren't doing very well, is, are the vigilantes sort of the last best defense in cyberspace? Well, they certainly were in this case. And, and I think actually the guys, and TJ was one of them, can verify this, uh, were a, a little uncomfortable with the designation cabal uh, when someone looked it up and realized... <laughs> someone realized that the de actual definition implies a kind of illicit or illegal activity. And so they subsequently dubbed themselves the Conficker Working Group. But it's just like if you're the fat kid on the playground and uh, people start calling you skinny, uh, there's just no way that you're ever going to get rid of, uh, of that. So they continue to be, even amongst themselves, to call themselves the cabal. TJ, will you take issue with the notion of vigilante? I mean, where yeah, I think, I think vigilante is not the right term. I think we've, Microsoft's been called vigilante in some of the operations that we've done, despite the fact that we've actually gone to court and got legal authorization to do what we do. Um, I think it was more of kind of an awareness for most of us. Uh, that there's a growing uh, community of securities professionals from around the world that were saying, hey, we can take this back, we can do something here, because at some level, uh, the internet's operated by the good guys. The bad guys are really dwelling in our domain. Uh, so really, it was more of a, an assertion of the rights that we have around to, to protect our own systems. So yeah, I think vigilante is kind of a, one of those like lightning rod terms yeah. uh, that, you know, working in legal and corporate affairs at Microsoft, you know, they're, what are they calling us, vigilantes? So, but, yeah. it, but, but it is true in the sense that it was an ad hoc assembly of, for the most part, volunteers. Uh, who spent a lot of time and energy trying to mount uh, an effort to protect uh, the internet from this threat, um, and, and they were, you know, they, there was no formal organization leading them. How hard was it for you to break down their, you know, post this when you started your book? Did did you get their cooperation easily with difficulty? Uh, did it depend on who? Everyone was fairly eager to help. I think they were a little appalled at my level of ignorance, uh, but I have to say that. They were uh, um, extremely patient, uh, and most of the folks who I worked with went out of their way uh, to help me understand, to read drafts of the story as I was writing it, to correct my mistakes, uh, to help me better understand the story, to tell it, because I think they felt it was an important story. So I wanted to ask both of you early on uh, uh, for your, I guess, Mark, this is sort of what have you been saying about uh, the state of uh, the state of security affairs in cyberspace as you go on your book tour, and then I want to get your gauge. I mean, so uh, what was Configure an indication of in terms of where we are in terms of having cyberspace be secured? Are we entirely out of control? Um, where are we? I think, you know, um, TJ can answer probably better than I, but my impression is, and I was really surprised to learn it, uh, how vulnerable the Internet itself was to uh, a threat, of a botnet of this size. Um, and it seemed to me as though uh, the very nature of the Internet, which grew out of the, sort of the uh, late 60s, early 70s uh, utopian spirit of freely sharing data, uh, and in, at the time, you know, primarily uh, by academic uh, researchers and scientists, uh, failed to really adequately consider uh, the, how the very openness of the Internet, which is such a boon to the world, could also be a tremendous vulnerability and that there would be people who would take advantage of it. I think the fact that the federal government, in the instance of Conficker, was really clueless uh, about what was happening and what to do about it was really shocking to me. My impression is that, in fact, President Obama in 2009, when he gave his speech about cybersecurity, he specifically cited Conficker as a case that demonstrated how ill-prepared uh, the federal government was to protect even its own networks. And I think so things have improved. That's my impression. Uh, you've seen a number of, a for, of formal moves that have been made by the federal government in the last two or three years uh, that have been publicized and written about. So clearly the, the government is awa more aware today than they were just two or three years ago. But there remains an enormous problem because it's a global issue. There is no such thing as a global police force. There really is no such thing as international law governing something like this. So, uh, you know, it poses tremendous challenges. I think the openness of the internet is both its greatest strength and its greatest weakness. You know, it's tough. It's tough to really kind of manage usability, uh, security, uh, on the same level. Uh, so really, the fact that the, that the internet is so open does make it vulnerable to these types of uh, scenarios. It was invented in a different time, a different era. Uh, I think the Conficker incident really was kind of an awakening 
uh, and I will speak from Microsoft's perspective, definitely a new way of thinking about how can we address these types of, these types of issues, but thinking around um, how is it that, that all of these great technology companies, and we're sitting in like the seat of technology right now, uh, how can we not be more aware of what's going on and how can we play a bigger role as industry to try to tackle some of these problems? And really, I mean, honestly, when, when Rick Wesson you know, called up uh, with, with a couple of my colleagues on the phone and said, hey, what, are, what is Microsoft doing about this? We were honestly like, well, we released a patch for that. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, so we're sitting there looking at it, and you know, we, we were having meetings, obviously, with trustworthy computing, the folks that, that and the MSRC, the folks that do all the patching for our technologies. Um, and we said, you know, we can do something more here. We, we should be able to do something more here. And that was kind of an awakening for, for Microsoft in particular. And you've seen kind of our Mars program explode into all these different ways of thinking about uh, cyber crime and the way, way people are using, our, using the internet and Microsoft technologies. But before we go too far, Mark, could you give us kind of an epidemiology for people who may not sort of know the blow by blow of Conficker? I mean, just the first half about how it you know, you did talk about it showing up in um, a honey. Well, I guess it was John who talked about it right. showing up in a honey pot. But just sort of describe the the beast here. Well, the worm itself uh, it popped up on Phil Porus at SRI's uh, uh, honey pot, uh, his honey net actually, and it was on his his monitor. And one of the what happens is when a new piece of malware drifts into his uh, space, uh, a, a line will pop up on his monitor, and there's all these readouts sort of defining what this is. One of which is a, uh, 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 a column which indicates how, how well recognized this virus is to the major antivirus industry, into the vendors. And this one was recognized by none. Uh, that's the first thing that got his attention. And then the, other th the next thing that happened was it was replicating so rapidly that within 24 hours it was shoving every other piece of malware out of his honeypot. The only readouts on his screen were Conficker, 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 Conficker. He said, I literally had nothing else to work on at that point. Uh, what they discovered uh, at SRI when they began uh, to dissect it was that it was a um, very, very sophisticated piece of malware. It was highly encrypted. One of the things that it did, which is kind of curious, is check to see if the computer it was about to infect had a Ukrainian keyboard, uh, and it would self-destruct if the computer did. Uh, but but, but basically, of course, what a worm like this does is, is penetrate to the core of your operating system and uh, replicate itself, uh, send out and, and, and infect every other computer on your network, and also begin calling home to a remote controller. Uh, the remote controller, the, the way that you would ordinarily kill a botnet is you would chop off its head. If you can intercept that uh, communication, you can effectively kill the botnet. So to prevent that, the worm had an algorithm that generated randomly 250 new domains every day. So that the bot master had to be behind only one of those 250 doors on a given day, whereas in order to, if you wanted to cut this thing off, you would have to shut down all 250 domains every single day forever. Uh, and, and so that was you know, one example of the cunning nature of the thing. And, and Rick Wesson, who I think may be even here tonight, uh, TJ mentioned him a moment ago, yeah. actually began buying up all those domains and putting them on his credit card, uh, which gives you a, a sense of how ad hoc this effort was to try to stop it. Um, before we go farther down the path of, of the worm's uh, evolution, I, I just wanted to, to get back to that question of you know, what kind of straits we're in. And I, a, a question for, for TJ. I, I have a, a, a very old email address, and I have a Postini filter in front of it, and since what, I, What's that? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think most of the people here know my email address. Yeah. <laughs> um, and since most uh, malware, I, I take it, is dr distributed by botnets, um, and in the form of, uh, well, the, the level of spam is some rough correlation out there in the world of the level of malware uh, infections. My, so I remember about a year ago, uh, a large botnet was taken down, and for a while, s spam fell off. But I have to say that if I look historically at the number of, uh, of uh, spam messages that are caught post by Postini every day, it, it looks like it's probably 10 to 20% worse than it was before that happened. And am I um, a good indicator of the state of 
it's a perspective situation, right? So, so you're, the operation you're referring to is Operation B107, the Rustock botnet takedown. So uh, we, we kind of sit back and read me and we laugh at some of the reports that were coming in. You know, one of them was uh, zero impact on spam. One of them was 5%, one of them was 10%, and one of them was 30%. So we kind of look and we're like, well, what's the real number? And we kind of determined it was a perspective thing. So we called our friends over at Hotmail and we said, well, did we do anything good for you guys? And I said, well, we see a drop off of spam of like 0.07%. I'm like, well, I was hoping for a bigger number. <clears throat> the problem is, is that they have, a lot of the webmail providers have systems in place that prevent sending of spam from non-known uh, non, non MTAs. So really, they had been blocking a lot of the spam that was hitting already. So we, we had a small impact with Hotmail. With some other organizations, uh, particularly private companies, they saw a huge drop off because the big spam runners wouldn't, wouldn't really be sending email to Hotmail because they knew that we were blocking. I'm assuming Gmail does the same thing in Yahoo. They have same similar countermeasures in there. So when we talked to our Hotmail folks, they say that they've largely managed the spam issue. But the thing that we saw when we were watching our honeypot attempt to send spam out, it was sending it out to a whole bunch of different domains. Uh, so, you know, we definitely saw Hotmail spam leave, but that spam would never make it into an inbox because of the filtering on our side. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what the real number is. I know when we start to look at these things, and going back to your original question, I look at how many millions of, of my customers are being impacted by this malware. Because if it's running Roostock on there, it's running something else, um, just based on our testing. So we look at it a little differently. Spam gives us cause to sit in a courtroom and say, hey, they're harming us. But when I look at it, I'm also looking at how many of my customers are being impacted. So when, I, when we started to look at Roostock in particular, the analysis showed that it would actually reach out to a piece of our infrastructure that we could track. So it would attempt to download a patch from our download center in a very specific way. So we were able to fingerprint that. So we knew how many of the machines, uh, how many machines we were dealing with. So one of the criteria that we look at, you know, in the Conficker case, it was a big botnet. Roostock was a big botnet. How many of my customers are being negatively impacted by this piece of malware? So I, I, think it's, I think the state is not great on the internet, um, but I really, uh, the past couple of years have really seen a surge in internet service providers and technology companies taking more of an interest, knowing that private companies can do more to protect folks. So I think, I think, I think the dark days are behind us. <laughs> uh, no, Genevieve, I need, I need some type of wood. Uh, I think we're getting that awareness. So I think as we start to really understand that there's more things that we can do, we're kind of coming out of that. So at our last conference we had about two weeks ago, we've been doing conferences for like 10 years now. This is your digital crime. This is the Digital Crimes Consortium on the heels of the International Botnet Task Force. We're really, we're, we're starting to see more people talking about how can we be more operational? How can, how can my company help? How can my company take down something <coughs> else? I would love to see spam go away as a, as a distribution mechanism, but I think it, it, from a perspective, from a, there's a certain perspective that shows that, that that might be the case, that there might not be any change, but we're still in the infancy, so we don't know. So uh, th this book is a whodunit, except I, I still feel that we don't know who done it, and I just want to check in with you guys to see, you know, where we are. Your book ended at a certain point. There have been a couple of things that have happened. Um, sort of take me through where the law enforcement aspect of the worm is, and do you guys feel that you have conclusive sense of who the authors were or are? Uh, my suspicion is, and I can't say with any certainty, <clears throat> that uh, the authorities do know who was behind it. Uh, and I expect, I suspect that the difficulty in apprehending them has more to do with diplomacy, uh, dealing with a foreign government, dealing with foreign laws and, and police agencies, than it does with actually finding them. What we do know about the authors of the worm, uh, without having caught them yet, is that they are tremendously sophisticated uh, programmers. And the reason I use the word, the, the plural, is that it's almost certainly not one person. Uh, because the worm uh, configure demonstrated such a high level of proficiency in so many different areas that it's literally impossible to imagine uh, that one person would have that level of ability and that level of knowledge in so many different areas at, at the same time. So the likely culprit is a, is a group, well-funded, uh, probably funded by an organized crime syndicate, uh, who set out to create a very large, very stable botnet, which could be used as a platform 
for all manner of mischief, a money-making platform. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the early indications of, of how Conficker, the infection was being leveraged, uh, strong ties to uh, fake antivirus, strong ties to some type of um, affiliate program, um, the, keyboard, uh, the keyboard check is really interesting. Uh, because nobody wants to uh, be arrested by local authorities for compromising machines in their country. Um, we, you know, really looking towards Eastern Europe to find out what, what that looks like. But it, it's one of those really interesting, I agree, we, we referred the, the case to the FBI early on. Uh, they've been working the case for quite some time. Um, I, know that they're, I know that they're working hard on it, but I don't have any, I can't, I don't have a picture of the guy. Maybe I'm just enjoying the mystery too much, but can you rule out the possibility of a head fake? I mean, if you wanted to point to the Ukraine, what better way and what more obvious way than putting in a keyboard? Yeah, oh, that's definitely a possibility. And, you know, I think that it's entirely plausible that someone would create um, something like the Conficker botnet as a money-making tool because it can be used for virtually anything. I mean, this group in Europe that was arrested earlier this year used it to, to, uh, for a scam to drain $72 million from American bank accounts. Uh, they did that just by leasing a portion of this uh, botnet. Was that the one time it was used? Or, it, or was it used several times for... Uh, TJ, you know the answer. It was driving that. traffic. In the early days, it was driving traffic to trafficconverter.biz. Uh, and, and really, what that was linked to was an affiliate program. Uh, so th they were definitely monetizing it on the early stages. Uh, but then it was used again later on to distribute Walladeck. Uh, so Walladeck malware was distributed through the channel. And was that... So they went through these stages. Were there, what, five versions? Was it up through ABC? I think that there were... There's some quarrel over whether uh, some strains are, represent an entirely new one or not. Wow, but you, I you did read all those emails, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> I identify uh, three strains, A, B, and C. C being the most sophisticated. I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, they, the worm was generating 250 uh, domains every day randomly. And, and when uh, uh, Rick Wesson and the Cabal got their arms around uh, corralling all 250, uh, the, the C variant uh, generated 50,000 domains every day. So it, it, it was almost like, well, you know, you, you're willing to spend this amount of money and time and effort uh, to, to stop us. Are you willing to, you know, make an exponential leap? And then they went one more step beyond that. They went to a peer-to-peer -peer communication. That's mechanism. right. That's right. In fact, you know, the cabal actually managed uh, to, to recruit the cooperation of every top-level country domain in the world all 110 of them, and, and got their arms around 50,000 a day, only to have the worm introduce peer-to-peer -peer communication so they didn't even need it. And do you think that the authors were doing this on the fly, that they were seeing what the cabal was doing oh. and they were responding and saying, well... Yeah. Without a doubt. Uh, you know, and they would put little clues in uh, that they were monitoring uh, you know, the, the traffic on the, uh, on the listserv that the cabal maintained. Uh, they were, they were uh, t tapping into SRI's uh, uh, system just to check on, you know, what Phil Porras and Hassan Saidi and others there were, were saying. Without giving away their identity. No, they didn't. You know, one of the interesting things that they did was that the, the uh, communication from the worm to the botmaster was encrypted with SHA-2 initially, which is the highest level of uh, public uh, encryption method in, in the world. And, and right now, there's actually a uh, competition going on f to develop SHA-3, which when it's, uh, when it's uh, complete, will introduce a, the new highest level of public encryption. Well, Configure A had um, SHA-2 as its method of encryption. Configure B used a proposal for SHA-3, which came from Ron Rivest at MIT, who has been the author of the previous two SHAs. And then, Rivest had a, a minor flaw in his proposal, so he withdrew it and corrected it. And Conficker C had the corrected uh, proposal from Ron Rivest. So my personal theory is it might be Ron Rivest. <laughs> 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 so when they went to that peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, you, you, the, the, the cabal or anybody else was never able to see into the peer-to-peer the, the -peer communication mechanism. Were you able to see the traffic that went between the... You so can still see in the, into the peer-to-peer -peer network. So one of the big uh, kind of 
um, issues that we face is that you know, we don't want to make smarter criminals, right? So when we start doing our actions, we want to make sure that we're, we're observing the OODA loop, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we're always putting the, the enemy at, at a disadvantage. Um, the fact that they went to the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mechanism didn't make it invisible. We knew that they were still communicating. Uh, we could still kind of track uh, to a limited degree, if we had enough sensors out there in the peer-to-peer -peer network, we could likely map a significant portion of it. And I know the guys at SRI were working diligently, as others, uh, to, to, to do that. But what they were able to do is they, they were actually able to sneak a domain in that we had missed because we were still trying to, trying to figure out how do we stop 50,500 domains per day. Um, so they snuck a domain in, the update happened, they only updated a part of their bot to that peer-to-peer -peer mechanism. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer mechanism is traditionally noisy. Uh, it's not as reliable as, as, the, as the straight command and control. It is more resilient to attack, but as you saw in uh, Kilios Operation 79 and Walladak Operation B49, there are vulnerabilities in most of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, pieces that are out there, so we're able to, uh, and oftentimes, analyze the, the malware and the traffic flow enough to, to be able to impact that. Somebody, uh, how many infected machines are there out there in the world still? Is, did I hear 10 million? Is that, is that a, no. that's too big a number? No, that was like initial numbers from F-Secure early on. Right. Um, and they were using the Q value, the, the unique string that was, that was seen in the HTTP update piece of the code. Uh, what we think is, I think the latest number from Shadow Server is about four and a half million uh, config or AB nodes and around, I think, 250,000 uh, config or C nodes that are out there. It hasn't done anything of note for how long? Long time. It's just yeah. out there beating. It's still, it's still, that's, that's, you know, that's but what Let me go back to, to, to your question earlier, John, about the, the head faint, you know, with, yeah. the, about, with the Ukraine. I mean, the, the most logical explanation for a botnet like this, as I said, is as, as a platform for criminal activity. But if it is a sophisticated faint, uh, you know, something like a botnet of this size is also a very powerful tool. And if you wanted to launch a cyber attack, it's certainly capable of overwhelming the root servers of the internet itself. Now, if, if a nation state was behind it, uh, you wouldn't necessarily use that weapon uh, right away. You would wait until you wanted to use it. So, I mean, there have been folks who've read this book and they're kind of disappointed that the real world sometimes doesn't offer a clean, uh, dramatic ending to a story. Uh, so it is true that the authors of the Config or Botnet have not tried to destroy the internet with it. But I don't know about you, the idea that some guy could wake up on the wrong side of the bed in Kiev and wipe out telecommunications in North America, uh, kind of is just, I find a little disturbing. Now, is your bet, <laughs> is your bet that, the, there have been some arrests in the Ukraine, but your bet is that they haven't gotten the configure authors? Is it to, Correct. Okay, okay. So, um, you know, there's, there's a spectrum of possibilities of motive here. One is, the most obvious is uh, just malware distribution or, or selling off least time. There is the, you know, uh, cyber war tool. But what I, I discovered in your book that I thought was just fascinating, and you, you had an explanation, except I thought there may be another explanation, is that the, um, in one of the generations of the worm, um, the nodes reported how connected they were. Right. So it meant that the, the authors were thinking about the structure of the social graph. Yeah. And there were some guys, I don't know if you ever ran into these guys at MIT, who were wondering whether uh, Configure wasn't some gigantic sensor net, that somebody was trying to build a, a basically, basically a surveillance tool rather than a, a theft tool or, did, did, did either of you run into that possibility? That somebody instrumented the net to... So there was ro robust discussion within the, within the Configure working group of what the actual cause or, or use of the botnet was. Uh, you know, everything ranging from, you know, a state-sponsored piece of malware that got out of some secret lab somewhere uh, to, you know, the, 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 the prevailing theory right now that's being used, for mon was being used to monetize scareware. Um, you know, certainly it could be, it was just, it's just too chatty. I mean, it, 200, so if you look at some of the modern advanced persistent threat malware that's out there right now, they're not generating 250 domains per day and being that chatty on your network. Um, this was not designed to be a stealth piece of malware. So how long have you been in this business? When did you start sort of doing forensics and this? Uh, I, went, I, went to, I went to Florida State University in the, in the better part of the 90s. So oh, Knowles. I got, I got you know, Mr. Bout and his, his, his uncle is the coach, what used to be the coach of the Florida State Seminoles. <laughs> uh, so it was really nice to, to see that. Yeah. Um, so ever since I was in grad school, really starting to, I, my undergrad's in criminology, I have a master's in information science, and really I was more interested in information security 
but you know, to kind of put yourself through college, you do, you do many things, right? Uh, so uh, really looking at uh, network administration, that's how I put myself through undergrad. Um, and I had an acumen for it, so, so I began to really start looking at those things. And you know, in, the, in the early to mid-90s, uh, at, at academic institutions, uh, really the wild, wild west was a, was a good description of what those networks were like. Uh, typically fragmented administration, uh, we were public university, we couldn't block anything at the edge. Uh, I'm, I'm, I hear that's still the case. Uh, so you, you, we would see some amazing uh, you know, traffic patterns, uh, and it was really a kind of an open, an open you know, honeypot the entire network was. Uh, so really understanding how machines were getting compromised, that's when it started to really pique my interest. Do you have trouble keeping your spirits up? I mean, this is kind of uh, like rolling a big ball uphill, I feel, at some point. I, mean, I love it. I love it. It's still it's I love still it fun. every day. That's my wife is like, are you, you going to come to bed? I'm like, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> and then you, you all experience that, right? The five minutes turns into five hours and the sun's coming up. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't think, and we were kind of discussing this earlier on in the green room, uh, I don't think I could wake up every day and do the same thing. And that's what kind of this type of thing allows us to do. And, you know, and I found that, that true not just of TJ, but of all those who were involved with the cabal. People asked me, well, if they weren't getting paid to do this, TJ's got a job. But some of these folks were actually doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, why were they doing it? And I think you know, the, maybe the right answer is it's fun. It's fascinating. It's, a, you know, it's like these people think they're smarter than we are. Sometimes I don't think so. They are sometimes. Sometimes they are. No, sometimes they're not. Never, never smart enough. The good guys will always win. You've seen all the cowboy movies, right? The good guys always win. How many uh, members of the cabal are here? R Rick's here. Is Paul Vixie here? Anybody else? Just, just two of you. Di are we a dying breed? Nobody can, nobody can make it out. <laughs> so, uh, so, what's your take on this white hat culture? I mean, um, what did you come away from with meeting this group of people who are engaged in this struggle? Well, you know, I, I think you could, uh, um, you know, make an argument that, you know, that Conficker is not necessarily, it, it's tremendously interesting and, and, and uh, sophisticated. It might not be the most dangerous uh, worm ever, uh, the botnet might not be the largest worm ever, but for my purposes, um, it's a wonderful case study. And it gave me an opportunity to uh, sort of walk around in a subculture, in this case, the culture of, of computer security geeks, uber geeks, I call them, excuse me. As long as you don't uh, use nerds, we're okay. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, for me, uh, that's the fun of reporting and writing, is, is uh, learning about aspects of, of the world and, and modern life that I otherwise would never encounter. And, and uh, so for me, that, you know, I think that this uh, is an, a unique subculture because the internet is a a relatively new phenomenon. It's grown so rapidly that you find that uh, the folks who are at the sort of vanguard in the field are, um, there are, few, there are few, very few of them. Uh, it isn't like you can go to, uh, well nowadays you probably could, but I know that when Phil Porras uh, went to Stanford back in, I guess the 1980s, I'm probably making him older than he is, you know, maybe 1990s, he had to actually shop around for a college professor who could teach him something because he had grown up playing with computer networks and systems, and it was such a new thing that he had developed a very high level of proficiency on his own, and, he, and it was really difficult to find someone uh, who could tell him or teach him anything. And I think that that, that level of a skill has continued, and, and it's developed in different individuals in different, for different reasons, but that, that's how I see them. It's interesting to kind of look at that too. If you talk to Andre Domino, you know, yeah, yeah. back in Jersey, Andre Ludwig, some Shadow of those guys, super guys right? Yeah, right? Some of those guys are basically, you know, self-taught. Yeah, Andre was, uh, you know, I think he went to a community college and he was, you know, running a, a security. Uh, he was an IT security guy for a small company in New Jersey, and he discovered that somebody over the weekend had broken into his network and used it to stash a lot of pirated music and, and movies. And uh, he was able to clean it out and, and you know, secure his network. And his bosses said, OK, end of problem. But Andre thought, wow. You know, and he went back and checked his system. And he saw that people were like rattling his doorknob all the time to do this kind of thing. And the idea that, that someone in Eastern Europe was trying to deposit a, a lot of illicit material in his little office park in New Jersey you know, intrigued him so much that he set himself on a course where he's become one of the leading uh, authorities on on botnets in the world. Did, did you spend a lot of time with the Shadow Server group or just with 
I mean, talk a little bit about what, what is Shadow Server, for example. Uh, primarily, I spent time with uh, Andre, but I also talked to Richard uh, Perluto, I think was one of the or originators of it. Um, essentially, they, uh, again, the essence of a volunteer organization, they began uh, uh, monitoring botnets, uh, dissecting uh, the, the, the malware that creates botnets, and killing them. They consider themselves to be uh, botnet killers. And they would uh, inform networks. They would just out of the blue, they would call uh, a network uh, a security guy, and they'd say, "Oh, we're calling, you know, uh, from uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, uh, to let you know that uh, your network has been hijacked, you know, by someone." And they would routinely be dismissed as, you know, someone pranking on them or someone showing off. Uh, but in time, people realized that they were right, uh, and they were offering this information for free. So Andre's philosophy is, if it's kind of like if you see someone's house is on fire, uh, do you charge them to inform them that their house is on fire? He, he thinks not. Uh, so he, he knocks on the door and he says, hey, your house is on fire. Uh, and so he does this out of the goodness of his heart. Yeah. Andre and I and Richard talk a lot about that, kind of that model of saying, hey, you know, what, what's the right thing to do? And, you know, they, they strongly, Shadow Server strongly aligns with what, micro, what the DCU is trying to do. You know, at the end of the day, we do these takedowns. The, the goal is to get to that, reach out to that end customer and, and, and try, to, try to clean them up and let them know, hey, there's some things that you need to be doing in order to be a good internet citizen. Technically, a couple of times you've talked about, uh, well, the takedowns, but are, are, is your group in, in, in engaged in uh, sort of wide-scale disinfection? Do you, do you mention some things that suggest that you've written code that goes out and takes infections off machines? Yes. Is that routinely done? So we, you we also do. mentioned getting court authority <coughs> yeah. to do that. So I'll, I'll be clear. Yeah. What, on what uh, scale have you done that? So the, the malicious software removal tool that comes as part of the Windows Update right. package runs on around 700 million computers each, year, uh, each, each month. Uh, so that's one of the tools that we use as part of the automatic update process. But so that only gets the machines that, that have the box checked. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so then we also develop tools uh, called the Enhanced MSRT. Uh, we also have a disk called System Sweeper uh, that boots to a Windows PE image uh, that has the full signature set. Uh, we engage with ISPs and certs around the world on all of our operations uh, to get them information from our sinkholes so that they can go out uh, and carry that message into their countries. Uh, so Walladeck was the first time that we had that remediation piece in place. Uh, and it's slow going. It, it was rough. It was ugly. Who didn't want the data? Who wanted the data? Were they able to, were they able to actually use the data? Uh, so we learned a lot of lessons in that. And it took us about a year to get about 90% clean on Walladeck. Uh, when we did the Roostock Operation B107, we actually had a 50% reduction in the first like 45 days or something like that. Uh, so we're getting better. Is that a long-term solution? No. Uh, we need to figure out what is the longer-term solution that we can really have more impact. Uh, but we kind of come up against the, uh, yeah, we're the good guys. We can't push code to that machine like the bad guys. What other mechanisms are there are available? So we're, we, we have robust debates. So one of the things that Mark did that was just so good, or at least compelling to me, is in describing your patching process. And when that patch went out, sort of you being prepared, realizing that there was an instruction manual that you'd given to the black hats out there, and you, were, you, know, you had alerted them to a vulnerability. To me, how do you get around that as a you know, just a structural problem that you're facing. So the guys at the in Trustworthy Computing, the Microsoft uh, Security Resource Center, they, they, they weigh on that heavily. So, you know, understanding if, the, if there's a vulnerability, vulnerability in the OS or any of our components that's being actively exploited, we weigh that. There, there's, there's, there's a lot of people that are dedicated to that. And we know as soon as we issue the patch, a whole bunch of people are going to say, okay, what did they change? Oh, here's the DLLs. Then they put in the hex editors. Oh, they changed these bits. They can, they can very quickly start to look at where, you know, what vulnerability was patched. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that's something that does go into the equation. So, at the International Botnet Task Force meeting in, in, in Virginia in 2008, when, when we announced the patch MSO8067, I still remember the number, um, <laughs> you know, we said, hey guys, let's start looking at this. And we had the advantage of having security researchers from, you know, 45 countries in the room. Uh, so, we actually got rid of that last session. Uh, we spent about an hour and a half with everybody. Uh, we had folks from the MSRC uh, in the room with us. Uh, we had samples of malware and, and, and some of the exploit code. Uh, and we started you know, kind of shifting it around. But we knew 
you know, it, it was definitely a warmable vulnerability. We needed to, we needed to get the patch out there. So and there were people in the room patching their machines like <laughs> over the Wi-Fi at the cert, uh, coordination center. Uh, <laughs> you, you should have probably planned ahead for that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was one of those things that you can't, you can't avoid it. You're going to fix something. People that are curious are gonna you're gonna look at you know what did they update? I right. know I have friends that do. It was what six weeks later that Configure yeah. appeared. Yeah, it was it was a really short amount of time. But right. I mean I have friends that do uh, that mod their cars, right? So the first thing that they do is they they take a snapshot of their the OS that's running in their car, they take it to the dealership, they get the update, they bring it back. Oh, would they tweak? You know, so it, it's curiosity. Uh, these guys are using that curiosity uh, for, for 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 nefarious activity though. Mark, uh, you, you paint a, a really a good picture, I mean, a, a compelling picture of the white hat culture. Did you look at all of the black hat culture? Did you spend any time on the other side of the fence? Did, did it no, I honestly, uh, I, I did look at, um, there are websites uh, where some of these uh, uh, purveyors are, are, they're openly celebrating their success. I, I watched online a, uh, a, a company party uh, that one of these groups was having where they were raffling off cars uh, to people. Uh, and there was a rock band and everything else. This was in Russia. Uh, it, but, was, it was very funny. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, uh, but it showed you know, the level of involvement and openness with which people are engaged in this in certain parts of the world. Um, the scope of this book, I, I deliberately chose to narrow it to you know, the struggle against Conficker. And since I didn't know, I was hopeful, to be honest, uh, that they would catch these uh, guys before I finished writing this book. If they had, it would have. Uh, I would have tried to uh, go to the, wherever it is they're from, if it's the Ukraine, and I would have tried to add that piece to the story. But, uh, but unfortunately, that didn't happen Thank in you. time. We have two hundred fifty thousand dollars out right now. Uh, anyone leading to the successful arrest and conviction? If anyone knows anything, I think Mark would definitely want to know about that too. Yeah, do, absolutely. Do, you, do the rewards work for you? Yeah. Have you gotten? Got yes. some tips that yes. Uh, so we issued uh, we issued I think four awards at this point. Uh, the first one not so much. The second one yes. We've gotten some good tips on the Conficker case, and then the, most recently we issued the reward for the Rustock case. Um, so we can't talk too many details about that. It's ongoing, uh, but it has been referred to the FBI and. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars is, you know, I'd love to have two hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> and people are like, well, they're making millions. Well, there's an additional two hundred fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> So we'll see. Do you have a favorite uh, success? Is it either because uh, you know the? I see. So I don't even use the success as as I have favorite things that have happened. You know, not necessarily all successful. I think I've learned more um, from failing than than the successes. So I, I would think uh, early on when we started to to kind of contemplate defensive DNS and and the Microsoft Active Response strategy, uh, you know, looking at SRISB. Uh, with the guys from FireEye, you know, I, kind of realizing what the challenge is. I'm sitting there going, oh, I have budget. Why can't I just buy all these domains on my corporate Amex? And, you know, my manager's going, you're going to charge $35,000 worth of domains on your corporate Amex. They're, that's not going to work. Uh, you know, you, you just figuring out, you know, that there's things that we can do. Obviously, buying the domains is not the long-term solution, but it, as a stopgap, it would have worked. Uh, so I think Srisby is really one of those things that, I think it motivated me and a lot of the guys that I worked with on it to say, okay, we're not going to let that happen again. Just a, a couple more questions from Mark, and then I'll turn to, we have some good questions here. Yeah. Um, could you contrast uh, reporting in this world to reporting in the Black Hawk Down world? <laughs> um, not that different, to be honest. Uh, you know, I made a joke about, and it's true, how I had to literally stop folks uh, every sentence to ask, you know, what it is they were talking about. And that was also true when I started working on Black Hawk Down. Soldiers, you know, spoke in a jargon, referred to weapons systems, uh, you know, they speak their own language. And I was, in the beginning, uh, <clears throat> really stopping people all the time saying, well, I remember once, uh, you're often mistaken as an expert uh, for the field that you've, in the field that you've just written about. And I was talking about uh, Black Hawk Down at the Army War College in Carlisle. And a colonel in the back of the room raised his hand and he said, uh, asked me if I thought a Bradley armored vehicle should have been part of the force protection package in Mogadishu. And I said, well, I think before you're entitled to have an opinion about a Bradley armored vehicle, you'd need to know what one was. And, <laughs> or at the very least, drive one. <laughs> so, you know, reporting is reporting. Back, back when I used to cover football, the sports writers would say, how can you go from covering science and you know, covering politics or covering transportation to writing about sports. And I tell them, you know, it's a transportable skill. 
Uh, the whole idea is that you go into a world you don't understand, uh, you find the people who can educate you, you ask questions until you arrive at your own level of understanding and you write the story. That's in a nutshell what I do and, and why I like doing it. So, um, one last question. You know, I think, were you deeply engaged in Conficker when, uh, when Stuxnet came on the scene? And did, how did you, as a writer, you know, you're telling one story and there's this other story that's sort of, I mean, the great thing about Conficker is it was one story and you, yeah. you had a cast. And that sort of was true of Stuxnet. Did you feel, like, conflicted because there's another big... Uh, not much, to be honest. Uh, I have a kind of disinclination uh, to try to be writing the same story that everybody else is writing. And I had no doubt that Stuxnet would attract a lot of attention. Everybody went over there. And there'll be a Stuxnet <laughs> book or two, I'm sure, before. Maybe yeah. you're writing one, John. I'm not, I don't I'm know. Not. Uh, but I have no desire to compete with those folks. You know, I would rather find a story that no one, no one else is telling. And, and to me, <clears throat> I mean, when I wrote about, I wrote a book about the Philadelphia Eagles 1992 season. I remember all the sports writers saying to me, why are you writing about this season? They didn't win the Super Bowl. Well, it didn't make any difference to me that they didn't win the Super Bowl. It was an opportunity to write about that world and those people. And so to me, that's what this story is. And, and the fact that there might be a sexier story that comes down the line is almost guaranteed, but it doesn't really influence me. Let me get the audience involved and do it by way of cards, because there are some interesting questions. Um, this is two part. One's a, a question, and uh, one's a comment for Mark. Um, the question is, um, what is the configure for Unix environments? <laughs> it's probably not a question for either of you guys, but... What's Unix? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, no, let me ask this question. Um, so, you know, there's this operating system called Mac OS that has a, it's a lot like a Unix uh, environment. <laughs> Very much <Yeah>. like <laughs> Why do you think you have such a, 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 a larger problem than the Macintosh world appears to, aside from aside from the fact that they have 10% or 7% market share. Is there anything else that's different? I, I think we can, we, can, we, can hang, we can hang that on a number of things. So market share being kind of one that's kind of been beaten to death, right? Um, also the fact that, you know, there's not that much money in it. So if you think about what the problem is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cyber crime problem. They don't do this for, for, for giggles like we probably did back in college, right? I can make people's computer do funny things. Um, they're about money. So what's, their, what's the biggest net that they can cast? They can cast a really big net on Windows. Um, I think the Apple guys are starting to see a little bit more of it. Um, I think they're, you know, it's going to be their turn to kind of have their, their Windows XP Service Pack 2 moment. Um, but I mean, at the, at the time right now, it's, it's one of those things that I think it hasn't hit yet. I think I remember this wonderful Usenet paper some years ago, basically making your argument that it was a question of scale. So if you make that argument, then you can try to estimate what the percentages market share they would have to reach to be at that point. And I think it was like 19.7% market share. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's also, it's, it's, you know, smart. Criminals are smart. I mean, they're lazy. That's why they're criminals. But they're, they're, they're smart, too. If they realize that, you know, an Apple computer costs this much more than a, than a normal PC, does that have something to say about the socioeconomic status of the people that are doing it? Oh, they might write, they might write banking Trojans for, 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 uh, for Mac OS and, and write a different type of spam Trojan for, for Windows machines. We're going to start to see more of that happening. Um, but at the end of the day, it's cybercrime. So I, I akin it to, like, I don't care if, if, I need to, if I need a car and I'm a car thief, I don't really care what kind of car you drive. I need a car. I'm going to go, I'm going to go steal a car. So really kind of bringing it back, you know, there's that obviously security ramifications. Uh, you know, Windows 7 being more secure than Vista, being more secure than Windows XP, kind of Microsoft learning that as we go. Uh, but there's also, the, there's also that other element of cybercrime. You know, the criminals are going to go where the money is. As a, just a comment to Mark. Some of us who have been involved in ARPANET networks, et cetera, since the 1980s have always been scared by, quote, configure instances and how to attack and how to attack them without killing the network. Okay. Um, another question. Do you think the worm creation might have been funded by a terrorist group like Al-Qaeda? No. Uh, and I think because we've never seen uh, that level of sophistication from uh, terrorist organizations and also the way that it's been used, there's nothing that stopped uh, the authors of the Conficker botnet from launching a massive um, cyber attack uh, on April 1st of 2009, uh, other than I think they probably don't want to take down the internet. They probably want to use the internet to make money. 
Uh, so if it was a terrorist organization, we would probably know by now. Yeah, and if it was a terrorist organization, it would probably be a little bit quieter, right? Again, it comes back to the, how noisy the threat is. This is to TJ. Um, what is Microsoft doing to prevent worm slash virus in the first place? OS improvements. And then it says in parentheses, like Unix. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't the first root kits written on Unix? <laughs> uh, so we have a number of programs. Obviously, the secure development lifecycle, trying to get uh, folks to code uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner that makes it more difficult to, to attack. Uh, Windows 7, you know, having things like uh, address, system, address space layout randomization, ASLR, uh, DEP, things like that. Um, we obviously have the, the trustworthy computing contingent, uh, an arm of individuals uh, from across the company that, that work to uh, triage vulnerabilities uh, and have timely patches. We have automatic updates. We have a division of our, uh, of our company called the Mal Microsoft Malware Protection Center, so we offer free antivirus. Um, at the end of the day, what we've seen is a shift from attacks against Windows to a shift in attacks against third-party add-ins uh, in social engineering. Um, so at the end of the day, we're really, I think we're making huge strides on the security front um, as far as OS vulnerabilities. Now we're working really hard with partners to find out ways in which we can secure some of those applications. Uh, one of the tools I regularly deploy on all of our systems uh, in our Fusion Center is Emmet, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. And what it allows us to do, it's a free download, it allows you to put some of those controls around specific applications uh, within the Windows environment. So you can actually have application layer ASLR, application layer uh, DEP uh, on the machines. Uh, so that's, again, that's, that's, you know, we're learning by being forged in fire, right? So, so for the past 10 years, we, we've really been under the scrutiny of the security community. And I think we've stepped up to that challenge. Now, at the end of the day, if, you know, if Granny wants to install the Dancing Pig screensaver uh, that she just has to have, uh, and that's been Trojanized, uh, you know, we try to make it so that folks have uh, an informed decision of what they're installing on Windows. Uh, but then we have teams like the Digital Crimes Unit that if something does get out of control, we take our legal and technical acumen and we bring that to bear on the problem and we try to, we try to protect our customers in a new and, and, and quite frankly, unique way uh, for all of industry. Wasn't it, uh, there a parallel? I mean, if you go all the way back to the Morris worm, it was a buffer overflow vulnerability, I think it used in part as its infection mechanism. That was true here too. What is it about buffer overflows that are so hard to find? I mean, what? what? There's lots of buffers. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got automated stuff. That should yeah, be so, so we, we, put a lot of our, our, we put a lot of our code through the, the SDL. So really, that's one of the attempts to try to, to, try to attack that. Then there's DEP and ASLR. So really making it more difficult uh, for the attacker to guess memory address to be able to hop to different parts of the OS. But you know, they're, they're sharp, you know. So we'll, we'll, close, we'll close buffer overflows and heap sprays and all that stuff, and they'll come up with something else. It, it's uh, a classic arms race. Yeah. I mean, every time in history uh, someone has come up with a way of defending the castle, uh, the, it, the attackers find a way to breach the defenses. And this is just happening in an in a intellectual realm. Yeah. So a uh, question here. You, you gave statistics on the number of infections. Does this estimate include pirated software? If not, what do you estimate the actual worldwide number of Conficker infections to be? So, the, so the, the infection number estimates are based on sinkhole data. So we don't distinguish between uh, pirated copy or a legitimate copy. Uh, so that, that's a true number. And it's flawed in all of its ways. You know, you, counting, we, so we just we, we took the kind of the academic argument out of it. And we said, all right, how, what, how many unique IP addresses do we see per day? You know, there's DHCP re, uh, address renewals. There's all kinds of stuff that, you know, th that will muddy those numbers. Uh, but if you kind of take into effect people that are behind corporate NATs and DHCP, we think that there's a 20% reduction in the number. So I think 4.5 million is, a, is, a, is the most accurate number that we can come to knowing all the flaws. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's the best number that we have. Um, to speak to, I think, one of the other sub-questions that was going to be asked, and I'll, I'll take the time to answer it, um, Microsoft does issue uh, patches to pirated versions of Windows. Um, if, you, if it's a critical patch, we issue that. You have to be at the right patch level in order to receive that, uh, that patch. Uh, but yeah, we absolutely do issue. If it's, a, if it's a critical nature for the OS, and you're running a pirated version of Windows, and you connect to the Windows Update site, you will be able to install that automatically. How hard would it be for a nation state to create a persistent botnet bigger and more stable than Configure? Not hard at all, I wouldn't think. Uh, it depends it, on the nation state. It does. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, if you, if you are, uh, uh, if you're aware of a vulnerability and you can exploit it, um, it, it you know, something like that can spread very, very rapidly. And, I would think uh, it's also even simpler than that. I think that some of the new technologies that we're seeing now are uh, new, new attack vectors through like the ad exchange, for example, browsing, browsing ESPN.com and getting hit with malvertising through a third party plugin on your Windows box. Uh, those are some of the things that you know we're looking at as ways to to do mass compromise and get people. Uh, but the tr the trend appears to be away from that, though, doesn't it? I mean, uh, for a long time it was creating massive botnets, and now the trend seems to be more these advanced persistent threats, where you have a very carefully sculpted uh, uh, ex exploit to for a specific reason. Yeah, uh, and, and that's what you see. It's kind of the purpose. So. If I want to make a lot of money really quick, I'm going to compromise a lot of machines knowing that I have like a six day window for the antivirus to update and go. If I want to be on the machine for a long time, then I go with more of the advanced persistent threat. So yeah, I mean, what you're seeing is a, is, a, is a fork type of approach. You're seeing really advanced malware going into the APT space and then new, innovation, uh, new innovative techniques to get onto the box uh, for more of the criminal enterprise. So you're absolutely right. I think a couple of years ago, the FBI stated that something like 100 countries had offensive cyber warfare programs. You're out there in the real world. Does that seem like a plausible number to you? Any way to? Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know where they came up with the number. I, well, I, would, think that, I would think that there's, there's probably yeah. most, most, most I mean, countries. In, in the modern world, I mean, so much of, uh, we increasingly lean on the internet for so much that anyone who is thinking about going to war who has a military uh, would incorporate cyber uh, warfare into their package. Uh, we saw it in, uh, when Russia invaded Georgia. We saw it in the invasion of Estonia. You saw it with Stuxnet. Uh, certainly any country with a major military or defense uh, department uh, is developing capabilities not only to defend themselves but to attack their enemies. So are we going to run into or have we already entered a stage like the period of nuclear testing where, you know, countries that were developing nuclear weapons were testing them in the atmosphere. Um, are we at the cyber equivalent stage where you're, I mean, I, I mean, Stuxnet certainly wasn't a test. Stuxnet was an act of cyber war, but do you think we've seen tests of, of, uh, of Well, you're certainly of seeing it in espionage. Uh, you know, there are, are, you know, mounting numbers of instances where a lot of it is traced back to China, whether correctly or not. Uh, you know, where uh, sec so supposedly secure uh, American uh, uh, networks are, are uh, being scanned for data and uploaded, data is being uploaded from them and spyware is being installed, keystroke uh, um, uh, logging and, uh, you know, this kind of stuff has just become fairly commonplace. Yeah. With the ever-growing residency of mobile platforms on the Internet, are there any botnets targeting mobile devices specifically? So we definitely see an increase in the amount of malware, uh, you know, kind of impacting the mobile platform. As, as our devices get smarter uh, and more uh, always on, always connected to the, to the Internet, um, that's a logical place. I think most of what we've seen on the Windows Phone side have been um, exploits either in the handset hardware itself or through the marketplace. Um, I can't speak of other companies in the Valley uh, that might be experiencing different things, but uh, you're going to see it. You're going to see it on, on the tablets that are out. You know, people are walking around with, with tablets and, and, and a mobile device. Uh, it, it's just clear that the bad guys are going to go where the money is. Yeah. In, in terms of your new mobile platforms, the, the various new Windows-based mobile platforms, how, are the interfaces common in any way that they'll be common vulnerabilities? How do you mean? So well, you, you have a Windows phone there. Uh, how much does it look to an attacker like, like a Windows PC? So it, it doesn't look like it. It's, so it's a forked uh, part of our code. So it's, based, it's, it's partially, partially based on the Windows mobile um, operating system, but it's almost a complete rewrite. So as we kind of go from Windows Phone 7 to Windows Phone 8, it's going to be, it's gonna be a, a little bit different. Um, and in terms of, as, as Microsoft said in, in, in your... Um, in the applications that will run on your mobile platforms, how similar or different will your strategy be to Apple's in terms of curating and trying to keep the universe closed? Will you be closer to Android or will you be closer to, to, uh, to Apple? 
I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll say that Windows 8 is going to have an app store. Windows Mobile has an app store. So we see, a lot of the, uh, we see a lot of the benefits of having some of that in the cloud. So if you think about how Microsoft is positioning our technologies, it's kind of that three screens vision where my experience in Windows 8 should be the same on any device that I, that I log into. I should be able to get those applications that I want on demand. Um, so the way we're looking at it is um, how do we vet those applications in the marketplace before they ever make it down to the device um, this will take a little, a little bit of explanation. Is the Tor project with untraceable routing a sensible I idea or tin hat paranoid lunacy? <laughs> I like Tor. So yeah. recently, I didn't read it carefully, but there was a paper on Tor that suggested a new set of, a new set of vulnerabilities. I mean, do you think, uh, I mean, how, how, how much can you trust your anonymity with Tor. Do you have any sense? Of I, I think it's, it comes back to that same question. Software is written by humans. Humans are in, inherently fallible. Nobody's going to write the perfect code. Maybe it's been written in here by someone in this room, and we don't know about it. Uh, if you are, I have some business cards. I'd like to hook you up with a, with a job. Um, it, it's one of those things that if you poke and prod enough about, you know, at any piece of software, you're going to find new and interesting ways. And what I think is interesting is that, and you alluded to it earlier in the conversation, was most of the vulnerabilities that we're looking at are buffer overruns, you know, memory, memory type modifications. Well, what's next? That's what I'm thinking about is, OK, so we're trying to figure this out, but what, what are, what are, what are, what's my kid going to use to compromise my refrigerator you know, and let the beer out or something like that, you know, when we live in the, the, the year of the, 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 the flying cars? Um, so yeah, I think, I think you, you have an uh, if you're going to go out on the internet, you're going to use internet resources, you're going to use these tools, you have to kind of understand that you know, you, what software you're using. I think most people don't get that. I get that from my sister-in-law. You know, she's, you know, she's buying something on Amazon. I'm like, if you get compromised right now, whose fault is it? And she points at me. <laughs> I had nothing to do with this transaction. Uh, but, you know, that's the, that's the impression. I think everybody in the room kind of feels a certain part, part of that. It's our fault. If they get owned, it's our fault. Uh, so figuring out a way in which we can kind of manage that as well is, is, is kind of a difficult, uh, sometimes heated debate in my house. Yeah. <laughs> Are efforts still being made to block communications between the botnet and its creators? If so, how long will it be possible to sustain this effort? Uh, so, so right now we're in year two and a half or three. I think the, if, if Rick is in the room, uh, we just had the latest 2012 list come out. Uh, so we're we're working on with the with the with the the high level TLDs uh, to block those on the countryside. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult. Some of those folks have fallen off, uh, wanting to block it for for much longer. So um, I know that the, the the big TLDs are still doing a couple a couple uh, CC TLDs are still participating, and they represent the bulk of the infection. Um, really, the A and B infection is, is is a smaller group. So they've been they've been amazingly. Uh, open to continuing the effort. Uh, as long as we produce the list, they're able to go in there and they have the process kind of automated. And the, 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 um, the individual nodes themselves present a signature, don't they? Could you use that to, what are the, the intricacies of actually like taking it off of a machine that is you know, running an old version of Windows that may not have any protection at all? Is that a workable strategy at Absolutely. all? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you've done some of it. Yes, yes. So we, Shadow Server does a great job of producing reports for ISP and CERT teams around the world. Uh, again, Microsoft has developed a number of tools, as have a number of antivirus companies, to make it uh, pretty easy to get off your machine. Uh, again, if everybody in the world would just check the box, go out to automatic updates, they'd be clean. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, kind of working through some of, the, some of the mechanisms there. The people that are infected are basically people that don't have the minimum protections. They're not running updated antivirus. The bad guys have stopped developing code. This, co this code's been detectable for uh, the better part of three years. Uh, the, the, the vulnerability's been patched for the better part of three years. So these are just folks that are kind of in limbo, um, not doing what they need to be doing. Yeah. I think we're, we're getting the cane. Is that the cane? We're, we're through all of our <laughs> do you, do you Do you have one, one or two no, more no, questions? Is, we're done. OK. We're done. All so, right. So. That's great. Please join me in thank, thanking the panel tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Remember our November lineup. Look forward to seeing you here, especially for Celebrity Jeopardy. Have a great night, everyone, and thanks for coming. <laughs>